Good evening, I'm Katerina Georgieva. This is CBC Windsor News. Thanks for watching. Education workers in Ontario are on strike. Plus, six cars have crashed into buildings in Windsor so far this year. We look at why and what can be done. Residents in Tecumseh can now get help with rodents. A new rat abatement program has just kicked in. And an exploration of Windsor's World War I history marked through poppies. It's a strike the provincial government went to unprecedented lengths to prevent, but it's happening anyway. Hours after the Conservatives passed a law to impose a contract on QP education workers, the school support staff have walked off the job. Picket lines for QP and their supporters are being set up in other parts of Ontario today as well, many in front of the offices of Progressive Conservative MPPs. The CBC's Jennifer LaGrasse was out at one local office earlier today. There's been a lot of activity that is happening here. As you mentioned, I am outside uh, Conservative MPP Andrew Dowie's office in Windsor, and there is nearly 100 people that have come out, if not more, that are lining the streets here. They're walking up and down. Uh, there's lots of purple shirts with CUPE on them. Uh, people also from other unions, like Unifor here, showing their support. CUPE members are, uh, you know, holding signs. A lot of them say, like, I'm a custodian, uh, I'm a secretary, I'm fighting for uh, student success and for good jobs. Um, there's also supporters, as I said, people saying I support education workers. So lots of people have come out here today. Uh, as we know locally in Windsor, the Catholic School Board canceled classes today and they sent that out in a memo earlier this week uh, saying that, you know, it was in the best interest of uh, the health and safety of staff and students. Um, that board actually has 400 QP members, so they said they just couldn't operate without those people. Uh, and then the public board here uh, remains open. Classes are happening today, uh, but we're keeping a close eye on that to see how things progress throughout the day. We spoke with a custodian uh, who is with the public board. He said he would be coming out picketing today as he was against the bill the government had passed yesterday, which basically made it illegal for workers to be out here striking. It goes against the rights of uh, the freedom that everybody's fought for already. I, I think that uh, you can't go against that. Now, it's really unclear how long this is going to go on for. I spoke with two secretaries a little bit earlier. Uh, they said that they hope that this wraps up today, um, but, you know, they're willing to do what it takes and, and be out here for as long as they need to be. Uh, I also spoke with someone from QP who said that they're here for a long time. So I don't think anybody wants to strike. I don't think there's a clear winner in every strike, but I think we have to stand up for our rights. And I think they're in the long haul. And the more support we see from parents, you can see them beeping their horns. Uh, there's kids out here today. There's students out here. And it's important to note that we're seeing these protests happen in a region where the Conservatives actually gained two new seats uh, this most recent provincial election. These ridings had not voted in a Conservative candidate for more than six decades. Uh, prior to this, the ridings were held by NDP MPPs. So something very interesting to take note of here. Uh, as well, Windsor is, you know, a, a labour town. There's a lot of unions here. And what we're seeing is that support to come out and rally for QP. Uh, we've seen Unifor members here waving flags. Uh, we know OPSU locally, uh, they have said that their members are going to wear purple. They're going to be outside of the college today uh, during lunch break to show their support. And then teachers as well with the public board has said that on their off time, they will show support as well. Jennifer LaGrasse, CBC News, Windsor. This afternoon, MPP Andrew Dowie responded to our request for an interview. He says he was booked solid today and could not be available before our deadline, sending us a statement made, made by Minister of Education Stephen Lecce on behalf of the government. It states, all along, we made a promise to do whatever it takes to keep kids in class. We will keep that promise, concluding the statement with, I want to make something very clear. If CUPE continues with their strike, they will be breaking the law. Meanwhile, the Catholic Board says their schools will remain closed for in-person learning until further notice. Monday and Tuesday, students will have their work in all subjects on their Google Classrooms. Starting Wednesday, teachers will lead their lessons from their classroom cameras. The Public Board says schools will be open Monday, but parents should prepare if they have to adjust learning plans during the week. 
The Ganacho Trail extension in Tecumseh is nearing completion. It stretches for 2.4 kilometers along Riverside Drive from Lesperance Road to Lakewood Park. Some homeowners along that stretch have fought the project. Well, I think they realize that, um, you know, maybe for some they're, they might feel disappointed, but they shouldn't because uh, this is something that uh, has been in the official plan of our municipality for a long time. Um, the uh, active transportation uh, is ingrained in our official plan. We've always had the intention of connecting uh, Windsor to uh, Lakeshore. Uh, this is the missing link uh, to that puzzle. So it goes back to about 2016. Uh, and uh, the mass majority uh, of, uh, of the community have been waiting a long time for this uh, to be completed. The project increased in cost to $3 million. McNamara says $750,000 was covered by a federal grant. The project is expected to be completed in the next three to four weeks. Also in Tecumseh, residents can now get help to deal with rats. The town has launched an abatement program. It will send out a contractor and provide a rebate to property owners once a year. McNamara says the most important thing people can do is eliminate food sources for the rodents. At least six incidents of cars crashing into buildings have occurred in 2022. The most recent one being a car crashing into Dairy Delight this week. TJ Deer looks into why this has been happening and what can be done. It was not the birthday present Matthew Bolton imagined. On April 24th this year, a car crashed into the storefront of the art lab on the intersection of Ottawa and Parent. Bolton and his wife were out of town when it happened. An alert from their security system woke them up in the middle of the night. I was kind of in shock being start woken up by that and seeing that um, happen. So then, you know, phone calls are starting to come in from the security company. Um, one of my staff members was actually um, on hand because he had gotten the notification as well. The art lab had to close for a week while repairs were completed. But the crash at the art lab is not an isolated incident. At least six instances where cars have crashed into buildings have occurred this year. The most recent one happened on Monday evening at the Dairy Delight building on Howard Avenue. Windsor Police Constable Talia Natishak said the Windsor Police Service have investigated several crashes this year where vehicles have ended up into businesses or residents, but she did not say how many crashes were investigated. Alongside medical episodes and alcohol, a personal injury lawyer gave another potential reason drivers may unintentionally crash their car into buildings. They get confused that they press the wrong pedal. Uh, this has happened in my experience a few times where uh, an elderly person gets confused, presses the gas pedal instead of the brake pedal, and before they can adjust, they're inside the building. With collisions like this happening frequently in Windsor, it raises the question, what solutions are there? This traffic expert has two ideas. You'll often see the um, you know, the landowners or the tenants erecting concrete bollards as, as sort of a bit of a safety measure. In the long-term view, um, some would argue that that's one of the, I guess, real benefits of any autonomous vehicles, for example, is that it does take that human element out of the driving equation. Bolton, Katzman, and Woodsma all say that lowering speed limits would not make a difference. Bolton says the speed limit on Ottawa Street can't go any lower, and Katzman and Woodsma said drivers may choose to intentionally break the speed limit. TJ Deer, CBC News, Windsor. More now on Ontario's education workers on strike. How might the showdown between the union and the province play out in the coming days? The province is now asking the Labour Relations Board to deem QP's actions an illegal strike. Lorenda Redekop is looking into that part of the story. The workers united will never be defeated. Union leader Laura Walton was among the thousands of QP members gathered outside Queen's Park. Today, unlike yesterday, she did not call their actions a strike. It's pretty clear that this is a political protest. We're not out in front of schools. We're out in front of MPP's offices. A few hours later, an emergency hearing of the Ontario Labour Relations Board started. The province wants it to call CUPE's actions an illegal strike. Walton says the union's lawyers are working on it. Even though the legislation passed late yesterday mandating a contract for them, she had this message for the Premier. You can call us. You can meet with us. You can come to a table with a fair deal. And you can repeal that draconian piece of legislation right now. But that's unlikely to happen. 
In a statement, Education Minister Stephen Lecce said, nothing matters more right now than getting all students back in the classroom, and we will use every tool available to us to do so. Today, the ministry sent a memo to daycares advising them not to accept school-aged children for full-day care if schools are closed. Here's one example of a message from a daycare operator confirming to parents it will not be running full-day programming for kindergarten and school-aged children next week if the strike continues. Today, the Prime Minister once again weighed in on the province using the notwithstanding clause, saying the federal government is looking into what it can do. Canadians should be extremely worried about suspension of our most fundamental rights and freedoms. The Charter of Rights and Freedoms cannot become a suggestion. That's as many other unions are supporting QP. This labour relations expert says both sides in this dispute misjudged the other's perspective. And if the government is promising to put kids in school, then they're going to get support there. But again, even as parents, we want school that's of quality, right? We want people who are motivated to go to school. Uh, and I think that's the other part of the equation, that you don't just get by autocratically forcing people to do X. That report from CBC's Lorenda Radekop in Toronto. The public inquiry into the federal government's use of the Emergencies Act turned its attention beyond the events in Ottawa for the first time today. It began looking into the border blockade in Coutts, Alberta, where 13 people were arrested during a parallel protest. Jeremy McKenzie, the leader of a far-right online movement associated with them, was before the commission today. CBC's Rafi Bujikanian has the details. Across the country from Ottawa last winter, a parallel protest at the Coots border crossing in Alberta, with a more ominous outcome. Some of the 13 people arrested there face charges related to weapons and conspiracy to murder RCMP officers. The National Police Force also showcased this. You see on there, there's two patches with the diagonal symbol, correct? Yes, it does appear that that is the case. An online far-right movement started by Jeremy McKenzie, appearing virtually today as a witness as he faces assault and weapons charges of his own unrelated to either convoy protest. He admitted he knows Chris Lysak, the man the Mounties say was arrested wearing the vest, but denied Diagolon is the national security threat both the RCMP and CSIS have warned about. Much of this, um, this narrative is, is coming from certain... Uh, actors and members of the media. The people that I believe are deciding what is and what is not as a hate symbol are uh, incredibly disingenuous and, um, you know, kind of smear merchants. Um, it was would have been kind of a kind of a gotcha trophy. Denial also front and center about how much warning protesters received from police to clear Ottawa before law enforcement swept in three weeks into February. You were upset and you were crying because it was over and they told you to leave. I was upset and I was crying because of what they were proposing to do to Canadian citizens. That exchange over a meeting between police liaison teams and convoy organizers, including Tamara Leach. Police logs entered into evidence state officers believe they clearly told Leach and others it was time to go. It seems pretty clear to me that you were given the message, right? I was never told I needed to leave. So the PLTs, uh, that's fabricated. I, rem I remember when they came in and we had the discussion. Next week, the inquiry will move mostly away from Ottawa, focusing on events in Coots and Windsor. But it could well interview Ontario's Premier and Deputy Premier too, should they lose their battle in court to avoid testimony. Rafi Bujikani on CBC News, Ottawa. Mayor Drew Dilkins is scheduled to appear at the inquiry on Monday. We will be following his appearance as well as that of other local decision makers, including police officials, as they also speak at the hearing. Some street signs in South Walkerville are adorned with poppies like Ypres, Psalm and Vimy. And if you've ever wondered why, there's an event coming up to satisfy your inquisitive nature in the lead up to Remembrance Day. The South Walkerville Great War Street Sign Walking Tour is tomorrow and will also teach you about those in Windsor who served during World War, World War I. The CBC's Mike Evans met up with a tour guide to get a sneak peek.
This one has so much significance uh, as Remembrance Day is coming up. So it's really a moment to highlight and honor our fallen so soldiers, our soldiers who were killed in action from Windsor, from Windsor and Essex County, who gave the greatest sacrifice for, uh, for Canada. So it's, it's really for them and to tell some of their stories and to highlight some of the battles uh, that you see depicted on Ypres and Somme, so on and so forth. You're talking about the battles depicted. The streets were named after World War I battles and those streets have poppies on their street signs. Tell me a little bit about that. So it's always, it will always act as a reminder for residents uh, in the community just to recognize and make that connection with these names, with the battles. If they might not recognize something like uh, Yeep, for example, then with that poppy, they'll kind of understand, oh, okay, it's associated with Remembrance Day. It's just a collective effort around Remembrance Day to share those stories and to remind the public uh, of the significance. All of these people um, locally here, they did give their life as young as 16, 17 to uh, fight for our country. Um, there's something so uh, uh, selfless about that act. And I think for that, we really need to honor that. The tour is tomorrow afternoon between 2 and 4, starting at the Optimist Community Centre. You do have to register first, and you can do that online. A live look outside there. We got to tell you that there is a special weather statement in effect. Strong winds are blowing on through here tomorrow. Josiah Sinanin will have more on weather right after the break. Stay with us.
It is time now for a look at our weather forecast, and for that, we have Josiah Sinanen with us Hello. once again. Josiah, we've been so lucky this week. It's oh been my goodness. absolutely beautiful, <laughs> and everybody wants to know how long will this last? Yeah, Kat, well, you know what? We're in luck. We have actually a really nice forecast coming up still. Let's take a look at our five-day. Today, we reached a high of 23 earlier, which actually made us Environment Canada's hot spot in the country. We had the highest temperature in Canada for a couple hours this mm. afternoon, something to be proud of. <laughs> and taking a look at things now, it's actually going to stay around 20 degrees for the next hour or so. And then overnight, we're dropping to a low of 16. Tomorrow is now looking warmer than forecasted. Yesterday, with a high of 22, 40% chance of showers during the day, and those will continue into the evening with a low of 10 tomorrow. Nice to have some precipitation in there. And I should mention Environment Canada has a special weather statement for Saturday. As you mentioned earlier, Kat, strong winds ranging from 70 kilometers an hour up to 90 is possible. It is expected to start in the afternoon and end during the evening. Now, moving on to Sunday, we have a high of 17 and sunny, nighttime low of 5. Monday, similar conditions with a high of 15 and low of 3. And Tuesday, that pattern continues with a high of 13 and a night low of 4. Another sunny day. So amazing to see those patterns stay consistent as we creep further into the month. And as you said, it will be fun to see how long that lasts. Definitely. And now we're going to shift gears to another conversation, which I'm excited about. <laughs> we're going to talk about geese because yes. uh, we talk a lot about geese here in Windsor because they're along our riverfront all the time. But some might wonder why are they still here in November? And you've got some fast facts for us. Yes, that's right, Kat. Yeah. So I am probably like a lot of Canadians, I have been misguided. I was under a misconception that Canada geese migrate south, and I think a lot of us think that way. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, you know, maybe it's because the weather's so nice that we're still seeing them around. But actually, I did some digging, and I talked to my friend Donnie Moore, who is a bird photographer here in the region, and there's actually more variation here in the winter. So not all hey. of them leave to go south. So there's actually three types of geese. So I'm going to walk okay. you through them. Yes, um, walk me through Feel free it. to take notes. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I have a feeling I need to remember yeah, things here. Okay. That's a little hint for you. Um, Sounds good. <laughs> so the first type we have is the most common in this region. It's called They're called maximas, also known as the giant Canada goose. Okay. Those are the ones that cross the street we all stop for. They're long and they have strong white coloring, sorry, long necks, I should say. They have strong white coloring. And some of them will migrate south when the weather gets cold enough. However, here in Essex County, there's a special story about these guys, a man named Jack Miner. Mm -hmm. So in the 1950s, these birds were thought to possibly be going extinct. Okay. And Jack Miner was actually responsible for reintroducing and rediscovering the species in 1960. So now we have the Jack Miner Sanctuary yes. near Kingsville. It's a lovely spot. Yeah, Love I haven't it. been out yet, it's but really pretty. I'm going to yeah. have to do that. So the geese yeah. there in that sanctuary, they actually stay year round because they're fed, they're taken care of. It's a beautiful spot for them. And they're protected, of course, and they're protected under the crown. All the Canada geese are. So, yeah. so those guys stick around. The second type we have is called the interior Canada goose. This is a little bit more rare, and we actually only see them in the winter months because they actually migrate from further north down to where we are. It's actually from an area called James Bay, which is off the coast of the Hudson mm -hmm. Bay. So they're a little bit smaller, stubbier. They have less white on their face. Their, their coloring is a little more dirty looking with a stubbier bill. So okay. if you have a keen eye, you can maybe spot those. And we also have a third type, and this is the rarest type. They're called the cackling geese. I love the name. Yes, and Great. I'm sure there's something there. I, I didn't get that <laughs> confirmed, but they're easy to confuse with the interior geese. However, if you see them side by side, they're much smaller. They have a rounded head and stubby bill. And these guys have typical migration that you'd expect. Some going to Mexico and Southern US, some will stay here too. And Fun fact about these guys, they're the most international of the Canada geese. Okay. You can also find them in eastern China and Japan. Very cool. It sounds like you've got a little quiz for me here. <laughs> yes, are you ready to be yeah, tested? Yeah, I'm ready. Let's okay. do it. I know that was a lot of information. Okay. No, it's great. So our birding expert and friend, Donnie Moore, shared some facts, those facts with me, and he also mm -hmm. sent over some photos. So let me know what you think these are. We'll start with these guys. I feel like that's the classic geese. <laughs> that's the, what is it called? The, the, the giant one. Yes, that yes, is the that's giant the one. Canada the goose. Maximus? That's right, that's yes. the Maximus. Those okay. are the guys we see most often. What about this guy? Is that the cackling? That is actually the interior goose. Okay. So you can see the shorter neck, a little bit yes. thicker. Yes, okay. Uh, well, watch for those guys over the winter. And what about this guy? Is that the cackling goose? <laughs> <laughs> this is our little bit of an ugly gosling. I mean, he's beautiful, but this is a rare hybrid cat. I wanted to oh, throw in a okay. curveball for you. So this is 
is suspected to be a, a hybrid with a uh, domestic gray leg or a greater white fronted. So okay. you never know what geese will be out there this winter. Donnie was telling me that, you know, sometimes there's these surprise hybrids you got to keep an eye out for. But good job. Awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> and now I feel like we can all appreciate the geese in our city yes. even more because we, yes. we know more about them. I'll be keeping an eye out for all of them. Thanks for that, Josiah. You're I welcome, appreciate Kat. it. We'll have more news for you coming up right after the break. Stay with us. World leaders are gathering in Egypt this weekend for COP27. They'll address how they are living up to their commitments to limit global warming. In Britain, King Charles hosted a climate reception for about 200 global leaders, decision makers, and representatives from NGOs at Buckingham Palace. They included British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, as well as U.S. Special Envoy for Climate, John Kerry. King Charles is a long-standing environmentalist, but he will not be attending COP27. He was advised to stay away by the previous government under Liz Truss. Prime Minister Sunak has not reversed her decision. A spokesperson says there is not enough time now to coordinate the king's trip. And this week marks the 100th anniversary of one of the most iconic discoveries in all of archaeology, the treasure-filled tomb of Egyptian pharaoh Tutankhamun. Tutankhamun has helped Egypt's economy and public persona and political 
gulls a huge amount. So really, he is the one true pharaoh of Egypt who has been loyal to his country for several thousand years. Better known as King Tut, the tomb of the young pharaoh was discovered on November 4th, 1922 in Luxor's Valley of the Kings. The boy king who ruled Egypt more than 3,500 years ago was only nine when he ascended the throne and ruled for less than 10 years. Archaeologists say Tut's short reign was one that brought back stability to a land that was in turmoil. That is it for CBC Windsor News. For news anytime, go to our website, cbc.ca slash Windsor. Thanks for watching. Have a good night.